Oh, hello. Um, we're back to another Table of Imbles video. This one is Kill Team Thoughts, not not Shower Thoughts. You've had the Shower Thoughts version of this video. This is the more refined version of the four quadrant chart thingy. Okay. This this again. Look, I I had a great idea. I really think I had a great idea. Um, but the execution was terrible. I made a lot of errors on that chart. I made a lot of errors. The video was very sloppy. I was drinking during the video, in fact, um, because I just got really irritated with one thing or another. Um, however, that doesn't mean I should turn my back on the whole idea. I fundamentally believe in this thing that I've created as a way of presenting information. I, I fundamentally do. And I want to refine it and get it right. It's like if you tried to bake, and I apologies for whoever I've taken this, this is just the best image that comes up when you do a Google image search for, um, what did I search for? Terrible cakes with a, an open open source filter on. So thank you to whoever took this open source image of some failed cakes. Uh, it's a great metaphor, I think, for my last video. Delicious chocolate cake is good. You just need to execute them better. If this happens, you don't turn around and say, I will never again make chocolate cake. So... Here is where we're at now with uh, with with the four quadrant graph. So for those of you that don't that haven't seen the last video or don't remember, the basic idea is that teams are judged on these two axes. We've got stats at the top. We've got tricks at the bottom. We've got horde over on the left hand side and we've got elite over on, on the right hand side. So here are the most numerous teams, and here are the more uh, elite teams. Now, let's go through this properly. So, over here, in a class of their own, Horde-wise, we have the um, the Krieg. Now, people get on my back about the placement of the Krieg on the last one. It was actually a point that I really wanted to make about the Krieg. The Krieg are a, uh, a stats team. They, they have some tricks. They're not right across at the top anymore. They do have some tricks with the spotter. But largely, they are a stats team. Yeah, the individual Kriegsman does not have excellent uh, stats on his card. What they have is guns. Lots of guns. Okay? And the ability to bring all of those guns to bear all the time, forever, uh, with 14 bodies. Those raw numbers are what make them really good. Yes, they have orders. Yes, the orders let them re-roll ones. But actually, that ability by itself doesn't really constitute a trick. I mean, Kazakh can have the elite mechanic, but that's not actually that tricky. Okay. Then we move on to the... Uh, so there's no one in the 13-man uh, sort of column. Um, I know that you can run... Uh, Chaos bloodied guys with with that with that number of men. You can run you steal a cult with that number of men, but realistically, we want to be looking here in twelve man uh, camp here, um, right at the top. King of the stats are Tau. Tau Pathfinders used to be a real have it all team. Uh, they used to be a team with both uh, stats and tricks. They would kind of transcend this diagram. Um, People still make the mistake of thinking of Tau as a tricks-based team. They have tricks, but their tricks have largely been nerfed, right? Their marker light shenanigans and their uh, massive turn one chain activation. The reason that Pathfinders are still really popular in the meta, I'm convinced, is just because their guns... And I, I pre appreciate I'm replacing, or repeating a lot of things I said last video. Their guns are damn good, right? And they have... Um, they have... They have... Uh, 12, 12, 12, 12 bodies. 12 bodies, which is absurd. People think of 10-man teams as being the norm. Actually, we can see from this more correct distribution that 11, even though there's not that many teams at 11-man, that's kind of the middle of this big cluster of, of teams, right? So 12 bodies, really, really good guns. They're just a really, a really strong team for that reason, okay? Breaches, uh, I've put them here as an um, 
as an, a 12-man team, I think that's accurate. I think if you want to play Breachers sort of competitively, what you take as your default build is 12 men, and you don't take either of the sort of Pokemon. Um, Breachers are more on the tricky side. They don't have the raw stats, although their stats are not awful. They're kind of at the top of uh, the, the, the sort of stats to tricks ratio. They're a bit kind of more tanky than the bloodied i guess and honestly very similar to the bloodied in terms of um the kind of damage output they can do but i think the bloodied are more require more re require more finesse to play well so that's why i've put them as being slightly more tricky right uh i think that um you know the the imperial navy guys um i never played them so this is all second hand information I think the Imperial Navy guys generally are regarded as a solid a solid team. So kind of in the middle there in, in view of stats versus tricks. We've got the Bloodied who are, uh, you know, a little bit more tricky in my view because they've got tokens to manage and things like that. And then the, 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 the Wormblade below them. Again, another of these teams. They can run with fewer... Uh, with more guys, rather, if, if you take less sort of big characters. But again, it's another team which is a uh, a 12-man uh, team with, I guess, relying more on tricks because they bring less obvious stat firepower. They're a very tricky team. You need to use them well. You need to know when to bring on your infiltrators. You need to have to do various sets of combos with them. And even their kind of beat-stick characters can be quite tricky in how to use them well, right? So... I don't want to reinvent the wheel. We've got stats, tricks. Um, I explain If you haven't seen the previous video, the Kill Team Shower Thoughts uh, types of teams, you need to really watch that first to understand this, where I really I'm just cleaning up the implementation of that idea. Right. Um, and then we've got the really interesting set of 11-man teams. So Skitari up here. Um, I think Skitari are largely a stats-based team. They have some tricks for sure. They're kind of, I think, about as tricky as the Vet Guard. Mainly what they have is the Sicarians, who are ridiculous. Uh, I really rate the mechanic at the moment. In fact, I should say, the green highlights on some of these, these are not my personal recommendations. This is what I've picked up from talking, uh, listening to a lot of YouTube videos, lurking in a lot of discords, kind of pick up what the meta is and what the professional professional but what the pro pro what the hardcore yeah we'll go with that what the hardcore players are excited about those teams that i have um outlined in green what i'm saying is those are the teams about which there is a competitive buzz that's not quite the same thing as me saying they are the meta teams although it you may think it has quite a lot of overlap these are the teams where i think there is a competitive buzz Bloodied, most people wouldn't actually, I don't think, think of them as a meta team, but they were taken to the uh, Kill Team Invitationals. So that makes there be a certain buzz about them, right? Speaking of those Invitationals, you know that Mechanicum were the only team that was taken more than once at those Invitationals. So there's clearly a buzz there. Maybe we're expecting to get a nerf. I don't know. That's not this video. Crude, I honestly don't know what crude do, um, apart from lose games. I <sighs> That sounds really harsh. I don't... I live in hope that somebody will crack crude, and then they will be like, oh yeah, no, crude really... It, maybe they're going to be like, Beck and Galva, right? Everyone thought they were rubbish, and then somebody works them out, and they're like, actually, crude are really good. Uh, I think they're a somewhat tricky team, but yet they have kind of got guns as well that are pretty... Maybe they deserve to be further down this tricks axis, right? I just fundamentally don't get crew. Um, but they have got some guns, they have got some firepower, but not enough of it, and they have to buy equipment to be good at various things, and it's difficult. It's difficult. Uh, Thousand Sons are here, and Thousand Sons are also here. Thousand Sons can sort of exist anywhere along this line, depending on how many. So this represents a sorcerer and ten sangorgs. And this represents, uh, you know, six, three sorcerers, three rubrique. Um Yeah, I, I think their trickiness increases the more sangors you take, because the more sangors you take, 
the cleverer you kind of have to be to get something out of them because there's not much going for in those angles. I'm not saying all horde armies are inherently tricky, but horde armies with rubbish guns are inherently tricky. Like, if you look at the hordes that I've put in the stats block, they're up here because they've got really good guns. Or in the case of Sakarians, because half the team is a really good uh, chassis, right? But these two get classified as... I, I really want to end this... I said this in a previous video. I really want to end this dichotomy where people go, oh, well, well, all horde teams are tricky. And all elite teams are stats-based. I don't think that's true. You can see that it clusters. Like, this quadrant is really full. And this quadrant is pretty full. This quadrant is very empty. And this quadrant is, is middling right is middling but we need to end this dichotomy where people go oh if it's a if it's a horde team um you know it's 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 got to be tricky these are stats hordes these are stats hordes and stats hordes is a powerful archetype like these both have green borders these are both pretty fierce i understand among the hyper competitive players vet guard are kind of falling down the view of like oh this team's ridiculous but i I kind of think that's an anglophone phenomenon, first of all. And if you're watching me, you're probably from an anglophone nation, right? Um, but I still love... I will keep Vetgard there with their green border. They're still the team that terrifies me quite a lot as I go into a tournament. This is your 10-man uh, sort of column here. And it's only really nov novies that have sort of cracked it that people talk about like they don't win events i they still don't to my knowledge i've never been or heard of a big event where novice are doing well obviously the data that's data that's pulled from um best coast pairings does show them having won some events but what kind of events were they were they they're not events that i've ever seen anybody none of the channels the none of the anglophone channels anyway that do kind of event reports ever say oh yeah novice won hey i've whinged about how novies are perceived as being this great threat and i don't think they're as they're good i don't think they're as good as the internet thinks they are uh but they still deserve their green border um and then also star striders star striders i think need some help uh, i would say that because i'm about to finish painting my last star strider here's my euclidean vein on my painting desk which if you're in the discord you see my progress on her um, Star Striders, I think, need some help. We've got the Kazakin that have been very popular and much talked about recently, uh, you know, around on the internet. They are very much a 10-man a stats team, yet they have their elite mechanic. That's not really a trick. That's just a kind of roundabout way of giving them better ballistic skill. They're a stats team. They have lots of special weapons. It's, it's a stats team. Commandos, I guess, are also a stats team. They just have very little in their special rules. Yeah, they can charge from they can charge from concealed, but that's so doesn't require a lot of cognitive load. It's very basic to think about. They're pretty well a stats team. Neither of them are regarded as pretty popular. The oddball uh, here, the only nine uh crew team, um the the Corsairs. Um you know, they're definitely a tricks-based team. They have a lot of tricks going on. Yeah, they have a couple of guns. But I think they're very much a tricks-based team. They're not as much so as the Novitiates because they have a couple of guns. Unlike the Novitiates, they have a plasma pistol and then a collection of um, weapons from the lost and found at the local church. But, yeah, they are a, definitely a, a tricks-based team. And then up here we've got the, um, the, the, the Harlequins, the troop, Listen, people are going to take issue with this one as well because, um, you know, they've got a lot of tricks. They've got their Sadaf, they've got their Sadaf points, they've got a load of mechanics that they... And they, they, they potentially should be a little a little further down in this quadrant, but they're still fundamentally a stats-based team. The fact they can fly, the fact they have APL3, like, that's what makes them a stats-based team, right? They fly, they have APL3, they, their, their weapons are all pretty good, um yeah there are tricks to them i maybe i should have moved them a tiny bit lower but still definitely within this quadrant maybe a space maybe one space further down the gellapox infected people are going to say i've got these wrong they're going to say phil phil you know the gellapox infected are not a seven-man team so took the executive decision 
uh, to basically exclude death to models from the sort of horde versus elite thing, which is why Gellapox are here being classified as a seven man team. Uh, it's also why Necrons are down there being classified as a six man elite team. Uh, I know that people are going to say, oh, but the Navy have got Death 2 models, but you don't have to take them. And the crew have got Death 2 models, but you don't have to take them. Um, no, dogs aren't Death 2, in fact. They're Death 3, aren't they? But the Navy have Death 2 models, but you don't have to take them. You know? So, that's why they're there. I think that they very much play like an elite team as well. I think if you were to say, oh, no, yeah, they're a, they go in this column of, of 10-man teams, they don't play like that. You know, they've got three ridiculous elite guys. Uh, sorry, four ridiculous elite guys. Three kind of guardsman horde guys. And a pile of things that are also there to use up activations, right? But in many ways, I think the Galapox are pretty much an elite team. They play like an elite team. Uh, a lot of people have had a lot of success with the Galapox as well. I think that they are now officially the team. They're the team that won the invitation, in fact, aren't they? Galapox infected. Intercessors uh, and they're closely behind them. The the Chaos Legions are both kind of the this is the this is the six man team column. Very elite, uh, very stats based. I've put the the intercessors are, are above the the uh, the legionaries. These guys have a thing in common in which uh, I mentioned in the previous video, but they have a lot of complexity in them that you can sort out before the game. Like there is complexity to the uh, uh, intercessors, but it's complexity that can be worked out by nerds on Discord, and then you go, which of these chapter tactics do I take? Okay, it's these ones, off we go. Like, and it's the same with legionaries. There's there's, there's, there's complexity in working out, or oh, what marks are I going to do, and in what combination on my roster, and this, this, and this. But again, that can be worked out for you by nerds on Discord. Once you've got those out of the way, actually in the game, they're not complex teams. They're not complex teams. They don't have a lot of cognitive lows. Um, and they're pretty strong, and they're pretty strong. Really interesting to me that neither of these teams were particularly uh, represented at the Invitational. So I, I'm going to get in trouble with Zimbad now, who genuinely, he kicks my ass every game, and he generally loves the Intercessors and thinks they're the best team ever, and he's probably going to go and, and, and podium at Wild World with them, um, probably. For yeah, But you could call these gatekeeper teams. That wouldn't be uh, that wouldn't be a massive stretch. They kind of seem to fill that role of people people who are on the very top end, like the bleeding edge of play, don't seem to gravitate towards them. But most people do really well with them most of the time. Yeah. Um, then we've got Thousand Sons again in their six model format, and then we've got the sort of sad elite tricks teams. Phobos and Necrons, who actually are widely... like, I'm going to talk about this in a minute, but these are actually widely tipped to be the two worst teams in the game at the moment. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about trends. I'm going to ruin my lovely graphic. But basically, Elite and Tricky seems to be a bit of a... a bit of a toilet at the moment. Like, it seems to be people cannot win with these teams. Because I guess... if you've got to play really well and really cleverly and really tricky, and... Uh, you've only got six models. Like, that seems to feel like a hard ask. And if you're an optimist and you tend to view, you know, Games Workshop as being some, uh, a more kind of um, a knowledgeable entity who knows what they're doing and makes good decisions, and then you say, well, people just haven't figured them out yet. Right? People just need to figure them out, and then the, the numbers will change, and then you, you can point to socially constructed things like, well... They're not talking about because they're not talking about. Their numbers are bad because people aren't playing them. And it's to an extent, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And it leaves that window open there for just that one kind of savant to come in and go, you know, shelve all the received internet wisdom. Right, let's not listen to that. I'm going to play Phobos and I'm going to win. And I'm going to do really well with Phobos. I'm going to make everybody reevaluate Phobos. Like, and the best players are players like that, right? I don't think that um, Ace or or uh, Crit or Juez or Chris Backing or any of these people sit in their house watching YouTube videos and they go, okay, that's the best team. That's not I'm going to practice with. They make the they make the meta by deciding themselves what they're going to play and then playing it really well. And then people look at them and go, right, okay, that's obviously really good. 
I think the maybe these are just if you're being optimistic, maybe they're just awaiting their champion. Or maybe they suck. Like I don't have the the chops to comment any further beyond where I've done. Right, and then you've kind of got the elite, um, the elite, the true elite, I guess. The 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 beef elite, the 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 kind of. Uh, you know, the teams that are, I guess I would say, probably the easiest teams to play. And they're doing really well. Right? I think these are probably the easiest teams to play. These four teams are the easiest teams to play and win with for a, a, a new player. And that doesn't mean that if you're playing with them, you are not very good at the game. Uh, you know, the thing is that actually, I want to go back on that gatekeepers thing. Kill team, there's this kind of logical, like, if you were writing a story, you'd want to have teams that were, um, oh, you know, difficult to master teams, difficult to learn teams. When you put in the hard miles, they pay off, and they will always win against the teams that start off strong, but that cap out with a skill ceiling. And people want to talk about the skill ceiling on teams like these. Um... And maybe it is there, but if it is there, it's really high. We're talking like, oh, yes, the top 20 players, whatever it is, in the world have abandoned these teams. Perhaps that's true. Like, no one took them to the Invitational, except for <laughs> except for Galapox that won, won and nobody thought they would. So, maybe, maybe there is a skill ceiling issue, but I... And maybe you can view them as gatekeeper teams, but I genuinely don't think it's there. I think one of the things that makes these teams powerful is that they're powerful for a novice player, and they're powerful for a journeyman player, and then they're still powerful for a master player. Like, they're just powerful teams. Um, and because they start powerful and keep getting powerful the more you practice with them, and the better you get the game, and the better you get positioning, like, people stick with them for longer. I feel like that's true. I feel like the, this is one of those powerful areas that the board here. And I'd say, you know, you've also got kind of um, the super horde. Uh, so let's let's go down here, right? This is a big chunk of teams that are doing really well. You know, uh, why aren't... Why are Gene Steel Occult not regarded with the same kind of positivity by Internet Received Wisdom as the rest of these? Are they just that bit too tricky? Just that bit too kind of tissue papery, pillow fisted, and their tricks don't quite hit home, right? The trouble is, if you buff tricks too much, you end up with novitiates. Now, again, I've talked about novitiates. Novitiates are a weird outlier. The Internet loves them. I don't really buy into it necessarily, and my... Uh, chart here would i guess show them to be they're kind of further they're kind of isolated from other green bordered things the teams that they are the team they are most similar to the teams they are most similar to are perhaps star striders or corsairs who aren't regarded or a thousand sons that are going sangor heavy none of which are regarded as like really really good teams um they have some special source for sure I just wonder how much of people's believing them to be a really uh, a really meta disrupting team is based still on the sort of numbers they are pulling pre pre nerf. And then the other one is Admec. Admec are really good. Uh, they're not really a super horde team. They are an eleven man team. They're a kind of a horde ish team. Like yeah, it's more than ten. Um, but really what they are is an elite... They're, they're really a fantastic example of, of things that have gone a bit wrong. They're an elite team with extra with extra guys, but unlike, say, uh, Galapox, where you can basically ignore the extra guys uh, because they are DF2, they're like... Sakarans are like slightly worse space marines backed up by veteran guardsmen. It's like a... It's a really good mix of, uh, of things. So they're a kind of a bit of an eye. They're doing really well as well. Um... One thing you'll notice if you watch the other video is we've kind of gotten away with this concept of oddball teams. There's nobody really... There are some outliers in terms of how good they are in a game, but there's no real, real oddball teams. I think that... I, I want to see... 
what do I want to see? I want to see a meta relevant team that's talked about that lands in this quadrant. Yeah, I want to see an elite tricky horde work. That's what I want to see. I'm not really interested in more teams that show up uh, here or or here. Like, God, in a way I am because I want to win games. And if 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 Plague Marines came out and they were here, I, I love Plague Marines and I'd absolutely pivot to Plague Marines and then I'd probably win more games because this is the quadrant of getting some good game wins under your belt now and again, right? But <sighs> this section here clearly needs a lift. And I think really, this, apart from the two teams I've highlighted in green, the, the, the kind of flabby middle of kill team needs a little bit of something, right? I think <sighs> some of these sort of teams in green maybe need to be toned down a little bit. I I think largely it's better to buff than to nerf, right? Try and rise everybody else up to their level. Maybe. I don't know. Right, final thoughts. Um, I promise this is probably the... I don't promise. I, I can't promise. This is probably the last time I'm going to mention this. Perhaps it's now and it's more refined form. It's something you'll find useful. Let me know. Thank you for all the feedback in the comments on the previous video. Uh, it's always taken really positively. Some people were in there being too, too harsh. Um... It's not the case. So it was taken really positively. Uh, thank you as well to my members uh, for sanity checking this version before posting in the members only room on 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 the Discord. Um, if you're interested in becoming a channel member, uh, there's a button, join button. Press the join button, then a video will appear, and you can watch that video. Bonus, you press the join button kind of video, and then you can decide if you want to proceed with that. It doesn't immediately debit your account when you press the join button so you can go and have a look around right um i will put an image version of this chart into the discord if you would like to see that um and then just to say life is really phenomenally busy at the moment so i'm going to the kill team event in december in three weeks Need to get a Star Strider. The last I need to get your Clidia Vein finished before then. That's not really a problem. I do need to get your Clidia Vein finished. I also am doing a Christmas miniature for my uh, local store, uh, my local Warhammer store. They do a thing every. I mean, it's kind of naked capitalism, but it's also really good fun. Where you put your hand into a Christmas sack and you put a, a, buy a random model. Uh, and then you have to convert it and paint it. You don't have to convert it, but you've got to paint it, and you can convert it along a festive theme. Uh, and I pulled the, 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 the Space Orc Beast Boss. I don't really like orcs, but there you go. It's the spirit of the thing. And my progress on the conversion is this. That's right, he is still on the frame. So after I finish my Star Striders, I've got to make a Christmas Beast Boss. I'm also feeling a little bit under the weather. Uh, more interestingly, my little baby daughter, who's just over two months old, is under the weather, and there's nothing more sort of terrifying or sleep disrupting than a baby with a cough. And it's Christmas, and uh, there's all the Christmas things to do: buying things, wrapping things, endlessly opening Amazon deliveries, taking the things out of the boxes, flattening down the cardboard, folding up the inside cardboard, putting that into more plastic bags, and taking that back outside so another truck can come. And take away all the packaging. I mean, not not to not to start on social commentary, but by about the third delivery load of me having to kind of shell these boxes and then flap them and then send them back out. And you do kind of think, why have we gotten to this point? That's another video on another channel by another person. Uh, if you've got to the end of the video, please do consider subscribing if you haven't already because if you made it this far you probably quite like my whatever this is patter wit uh verbal delivery style thing all right have a fantastic evening and thank you for watching me attempt to make good on what may have been the worst video i've made on the channel Bye-bye, everybody. Have a great uh, rest of the day, week, month, year, uh, 
and into next year as well because that's not a very long time. Bye-bye.